All right. So I, I do have a couple of quick notes. One is regex, man. Okay. I'm sure everybody mm -hmm. looked at regex and went, holy cow, how does one make that thing? So one is you can spend hours like some people learning how to make really complicated <laughs> regex, which is short for regular expressions, or you can look for examples and other stuff of people who have already made those regular expressions. You just copy paste. And Nate, that's what, that's what you chose to do, right? Cause more efficient. Yeah, exactly. I, I did a quick, in fact, it wasn't even Google. It was DuckDuckGo, And it even came up with, in one of those little sidebars, it just said, this is the regex you want. I did find a nice article that explained several ways you could get IP addresses. And this was the regex I decided to copy out of somebody else's work. <laughs> the other thing with regular expressions is you can spend a lot of time crafting a extremely explicit regular expression that only matches the exact things that you're looking for. Normally what I would do, because I wouldn't deal with that reg regular expression, I would make a command line with all the chaining and whatnot that I needed to take that line from the error and use like awk to chop out the IP address. And then that's what I would display to the screen. And then I would do the same thing with sort and unique and all that stuff to get the data out of it. But then I thought there must be a better way with regular expressions. So I yeah, looked it up and thought it'd be fun for today's example. Um, but there gets to a point where one-liners get too long and you certainly don't want yeah. to type them. So Vincent in chat actually said something earlier about having an alias. And that's a fantastic thing to do because then yeah. you can have a hand thing that actually runs this big, long, gross thing that you've made and you don't have to type it every time. Right. But another approach is if this is something you use all the time, you might want to actually make it nicer or yeah. have additional functionality that isn't really something easily introduced into a typed giant one liner. Right. And so when you're in that state, what do you do, Nate? So any command that you throw into the command line could be thrown into a script. And if we hop back into the terminal, I can show you quick the super basic rendition of turning this thing into a script. So we're going to open up a new file. We're just going to call it ips.sh. And then we're going to paste in this thing, which is basically the exact same thing we just did on the command line, except I added a shebang bin bash to the beginning of it, which tells bash or whatever you're running it from, what interpreter to parse this with. This is a bash script, so it's bin bash. And you can see it's the exact same command we just did. We're going to save this. And then we're going to chmod it plus X. If you watched a couple episodes ago, we talked all about what I'm doing here. You can go check that out if you want to learn about file systems permissions. We're going to call it, you know, just chmod plus X, make it executable, and then we're going to run it. And look at that. It gives us the same output that we just did in our one liner. And now it's repeatable, right? You just run the shell script. We can do more with shell scripts, right? We could have done that on the command line. So what would true. we do? that would make it even right. fancy. So we've got the crazy shell script. We've got the crazy regular expression in there. It's kind of hard to read on the fly. You can sometimes end up accidentally changing some syntax that breaks the script. I don't know how many times you've been in there. You change a quote or a double quote, and then it's like, oh, where was that closed? Oh, I deleted too many characters. What was it? Sure, you can back out of those things, but I always find it easier to take complicated things like that and put them into an environment variable instead. So let's go, we're just going to call it regex. We're going to enclose it in single quotes because this tells it to ignore any bash interpolation that it would be doing here. Just kind of paste it right up here. And we're going to close it in okay. a single quote. Wanted to make a note about that variable. So originally when we were putting this together, Nate used caps because I think if you look at the variables that are set in your environment using the set command or something else, variables are in caps. And I will tell you that I always use lowercase variables or mixed case variables when writing scripts. And the reason is because I know that environment variables are all caps. So if I do something like perm or path, it's going to overwrite the environment variable of the same name. But if I use lowercase, there is never a worry of conflict between what I'm doing in my script with setting and changing variables and what may be in the shell environment that may be used by the system or shell interpreter. That's a valid point.
I never really thought of it that way. I usually make them capital so they stand out in the uh, command line. You know, just personal preference. But that's a pretty good point there, Scott. All right, so what we did is we put the regex into a variable, and then we put the variable where the regex used to be. Now, I put it in these curly braces because that treats the variable uh, a little more... It defines the variable explicitly. So there if it was go. around text, it wouldn't blend in the variable name with the surrounding text. It, it right. isolates it and says, this is the variable reference I'm doing. We probably, in this example, we could have done just dollar regex and it would have been fine. Yep. But using yep. this only brace offset, is a good habit to get yeah. into. Yep. So let's save this and then we'll, let's just make sure it still works. We still have the same output, but we still haven't really extended its functionality at all. So what I really like to do with scripts like this is make it so that this file name that we're parsing is not hard coded, right? So right now, every time I run this script, it's gonna look for a file called error log in the directory that I'm in, and try to parse it through this command line, through this chain of commands. And that's not explicitly all that helpful. So what I wanna do here is, first of all, let's tell Vim that it should not be doing syntax highlighting, because I wanna copy and paste this out of my notes instead of typing it all live on the show. So we're gonna, first of all, just make a few new lines here. We're gonna paste this in. Then we're going to comment this last one out because we don't need it anymore. Because what we've done here is we took the file name. Now, if you're not familiar with this, when you invoke a bash script, if you type something after the name of the script, so if I did dot slash ips dot sh and then some word, that word will be thrown into a variable called dollar one as the first argument after the name of the script. Dollar zero is the name of the script, just fun fact, right? So if you needed to check if I was ip.sh, I would check if dollar zero was ip.sh, but of course it is, because that's what we ran. Dollar one is the first argument. Dollar two would be the second argument. Dollar three, the third. So what I'm doing here is I check if there is a variable that has data in it called dollar one, right? This tells the script, did I type something after IP data. If I did not, because this returns zero if it is empty and one if there's data in it. So what the return code is, is going to vary based on the thing. Okay. Or not successfully. Right. So if it exists, but it's empty, it'll say, hold on, you need to specify a file. Because if I didn't specify a file, then when I get further on and I try to do the grep and everything, there won't be a file name to throw in there, right? And then I check if there's a file named the thing that I typed. And this could be a full path. It could be a local file, like a file in the same directory. It doesn't care. It just literally looks for that path to see if there's a file. And if there is, it'll do our, do our grep stuff on it. It'll search for the no such file or directory inside of the file. It'll throw it through that regex that we still have up there in that variable. It'll do the sort and the unique and all that stuff. And notice where the file name used to be, I now have $1. <laughs> there we go for not being uniform, right? If it did not find a file or the file is not a file, because that's what the dash F does. If that's a directory instead of a file, I believe it returns a not success, right? In which case it would say it's not a file or it doesn't exist, right? And then it'll exit the script because it got to the end of the, the if statement here. So if we save and close this, clear the screen here. If I do ips.sh now with no command line arguments, it should give me an error. You need to specify a file. Okay, so let's just like put in some file. It should say, that's not a file, right? Which is exactly what it did. But if I type in error log, there we go. So now what I did is I took my one liner and I made it something that I can give it any log file that I want to give it. And anything that matches the, the format of an IP address should get returned by the script, right? If you can go back into your script, there are a couple things in your syntax there that I wanted to mention because we're like okay. throwing a lot of people who are new to shell scripts. Yes, exactly. Uh, so Nate introduced a control structure called an if then else. So an if then else is I'm going to test a condition if the condition is successful, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to do something different. For example, Vincent said, yeah. well, I would test this whether the, if the file or if the file name is there and then do my stuff. 
and the file name is not there, then do an error message. So there is a lot of like how one chooses to logically orient their control structure. There, there's no wrong answer. As Larry Wall, who was the original creator of Perl, once said, there's more than one way. Always. So we have this control structure that allows us to make decisions, to check a condition and decide what branch of code we want to execute based off that decision. The other thing is that thing in square brackets. So mm -hmm. that square bracket thing is called a test. And there's actually a command also called test, which does the same thing. That is the condition that you want to test, that you want to check. It can be a lot of things. It can be running a command and whether that command is successful or not. And that's actually right. what we're doing here with dash Z. Yeah. Dash Z is a command and it returns a success if the thing that it's passed is a zero length. So if there's nothing stored in this variable, it's zero length. And that is a successful return for dash Z. I had to dust off some bash foo to make this script. And this was the first one I came across, you know, time crunches and all. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then you can see that we have another test that's the dash F, if the file exists. There's also a dash D to see if it's a directory. So you can actually check like all different properties. They're actually built into the bash shell. So they're called bash built-ins. They're actually documented in the bash man page. So if you're interested in finding more of this, you can find it in the bash man page. There's others like equality checking. So equal equal or dash EQ. There's greater than and less than checking. Lots All of numeric kind of checks like that. Or string checks also. The uh, thing I wanted to they, call out quick was how I broke up this line here. I don't know if you had something else you wanted to touch on there, or is that where you're going yeah. next? So the original command was this big chain of things. In fact, you can see it down here, right? It has all these pipes and whatever's, right? And it makes it kind of long and hard to read. So there's a special backslash that if you've ever seen anybody that put anything up on a web page to show you bash ever, they almost always use this to make it more readable. And all this does is it breaks the command up into several lines. Normally what I would do is, so this is the first line of the command here where I have my cursor. I would take the sub pieces of it and indent them by a couple spaces so that you can tell where you're continuing the command, right? And then once I've moved on to another command, I would then take that back two spaces and you know that way it's easier to read. So I have a different approach, Nate. Uh, I actually don't like backslashes and I just put the whole big, long, disgusting command on one line and then I'll just resize my terminal so I can see it on one line because I'm lazy. I hated backslashes for a long time, but especially when I started doing examples and demos, I decided to start using it to make things more readable. And then I think the only other thing that we haven't talked about is echo command. What's echo? Oh, echo just prints something to the screen, right? So have it do something like prompt you for the name of the file. I could have it in the control structure there that says, instead of you need to specify a file, I could have it ask you for a file name, echo the thing, and then have it read. It just reads yeah. in from the terminal, right? You could type in error dash log, but if you specified one, it would just do the thing instead of asking you. And echo is the traditional bash built in for this. There's actually also printf. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to do edit printing or you're from another background like C where you're more familiar with printf and, and using it, you can use it in bash too. But the big thing is like you're running this command and you have to have the shell or the script has to have a way of communicating data back out to the user while it's running. And so echo is how we, how we put in our, uh, our right. output want to be presented to the user.